Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our seventh and final class uh, in this series on Come Holy Spirit, on the Holy Spirit, Spirit of Life and Peace and Joy and, and all good things. So as we have begun every week, let us begin with the Trinity Prayer of Richard Paul. God for us, we call you Father. God alongside us, we call you Jesus. God within us, we call you Holy Spirit. You are the eternal mystery that enables, enfolds, and enlivens all things, even us, even me. Every name falls short of your goodness and grace. We can only see who you are in what is. We ask for such perfect seeing. As it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be. So, we have spoken about the, the Spirit of God, the Trinity, what we mean when we say there is one God who is three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that God is a relationship of love, the divine dance, delighting in each other forever. We talked about that icon by Rublev, the hospitality of Abraham and how there might have been a mirror at the bottom of that, but we're invited into the dance. We're invited into that relationship of love. The spirit of life, <coughs> ruach and pneuma, which can also mean breath and wind, the air that we breathe and we live and move and have our being. The spirit of peace. We'll talk a little bit more about the fruit of the spirit, one of the fruit of the spirit being peace today. The spirit of truth. Jesus telling his disciples that I will not leave you orphaned. I am going away in death and resurrection and ascension. The spirit will come and guide you in all the truth. How do we know what is real and true and factual and good and trustworthy? And ultimately, it is God in Christ by the spirit. And the spirit of wisdom. Uh, not only knowledge, not only knowing, but how to live in that knowledge, how to apply that knowledge, how to do things by the power of the spirit, including proclaiming the gospel. And then we talked about the spirit of power, the charismata, the gifts of the spirit that are understood in various different ways by various different congregations. Um, but I think all would agree that it is the spirit who gives us the power to proclaim the good news and do the good works of the Lord. So today we are going to talk about the spirits of love, the fruit of the spirit, Particularly, of course, Galatians 5, where Paul talks about what the fruit of the Spirit is. But before we get into that, I thought we might talk about, um, because the fruit of the Spirit is, is a lot about how we live out our salvation, how we live out the life we've been, been given. Sanctification, in other words, which is a little bit different from justification, our salvation. So those are sort of the formal theological words for salvation and how we live out our salvation, justification and sanctification. Especially in terms of Martin Luther, his understanding and his essay, The Freedom of a Christian, which I've expressed before was a very life-changing essay for me. I read it first at Fuller and I was very, very moved by his articulation of the sort of cornerstone of Lutheran theology, we are saved by grace through faith for love, for service, from and for love, I would add. So the gift of Jesus Christ to us is our justification, Greek word diakeo, generally made right or just. This is what Luther would call, and others, imputed righteousness. It's just given to us. We don't earn it, we don't deserve it, we, we are found guilty in the court of God, so to speak, to use that language, even though we may not be. Even though our sins are as scarlet, Christ makes them white as snow. Um, the fact that we are found not guilty because of Christ, that we are freely, fully, and completely forgiven for everything. And that is not of our own doing. And that is the gift that Jesus declared he himself brought in John 11, for example. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. That gift of life now and forever, eternal life, abundant life, salvation, being
being made right with God. That's a gift. We don't earn it or deserve it or keep it or own it. It's just grace. And that is uh, in our first Bible passage that we will go to, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, the declaration of the author of Ephesians, who puts it pretty clearly about how we are justified, made right with God. And that is Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Is there someone who can read that? Thank you. You were dead when you were Following the words of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among the world is the being. All of us once lived among the companions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and sin, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead to our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Seems pretty clear. I, I remember in another class we were talking about saved by grace through faith, and someone said, you know, it's so clear. How come they didn't get it? <laughs> I'm like, well, there's a lot of things the church hasn't gotten and we don't get. Um, but again, it's not even about what we get or what we don't. Grace, 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 kindness, mercy, love is overflowing in this passage. Um, it's not what we do. It's not what we earn. Nobody is closer to God than anybody else by what they merit or achieve. Um, as I've heard pastors say, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We are all of us saved by grace through faith. Um, and, and our own goodness is not what saves us. Our goodness is a response to being saved, as we'll talk about later. Bedrock tenet of the Lutheran Confession. We are justified by grace through faith. Sola gratia, sola fide. Faith alone, grace alone. Um, and it's repeated throughout the works of Paul. In 2 Corinthians, God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. Um, the fact that it is Christ who makes us right with God. And in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, this is love. That God loved us, not that we love God, and sent Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And if we go to the Romans passages, Romans 5, again, this affirmation that it's not anything that we, like life itself, life eternal is a gift. We don't choose desire or merit birth. We're just born. And I would argue that's the same with our salvation. We don't choose merit or sometimes even desire it. We just are. It's a gift of God. So Romans 5, 1 through 8, who can read that for us? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have been justified, justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. So for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We we're still sinners. We didn't, we didn't create that change in ourselves. It is Christ who transforms us. And we'll see this throughout these writings, these sort of patterns of our trust in God, our faith in God that produces endurance and hope. We know we can go on. And that produces love and joy 
and all the good things that come through to the end. And we'll see that in a lot of these readings about our spiritual life and how we live the life that we have been given. And that's sort of that pattern is we trust, so we know it's going to be okay, so we keep going, and so we act in faith and hope and love and, and exhibit all the fruit of the Spirit. Yes, can we'll talk about. Yes. Can you explain a little more about uh, suffering equals perseverance. Yeah. Yeah, suffering produces endurance or perseverance. Well, it's really not when life is easy, it doesn't require a lot of patience or fortitude or faith to be good, so to speak. Um, in fact, C.S. Lewis, and I don't remember in what writing, but he was talking about how the very fact that we have to choose good makes it good. <laughs> it doesn't come easy to us. You know, we do, we do have free will. It, life is a gift, but how we live that life, we've got some choices to make. And when life is easy, we human beings have a tendency to, one, not appreciate it, and two, think we kind of did it all ourselves. But when life is hard, and you get through it, and you make it through, that's when you really know, wow, God was with me, other people were with me. That takes faith. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know? Hallelujah. You know? Um, it's, why, it's why Jesus says things like it's hard for a rich person to enter heaven. Because if you think you got it all together and you, life is easy, you got it all figured out, you don't appreciate your own need and certainly you're not going to appreciate the needs of others. It's, it's going to produce a lack of compassion and empathy. But if, you're su if you've suffered yourself and you know what it's like, you are going to be just by how, what you've experienced, I would say, uh, or you could be, we all have choices in how we respond to things, a more compassionate, empathetic person. Um, Stephen Carell, of all people, did a great interview with Anderson Cooper. Or not Carell, Colbert, Stephen Colbert. Uh, Stephen Colbert, who I know is a late night comedian, guys, but he's a full on Catholic Christian and is very vocal about his faith. And he and Anderson Cooper talked a lot about grief because both of them lost their dads when they were 10. If you, you can look it up online, it's, a, it's there are two really bright, articulate guys. And Colbert talks about suffering, and he talks about that's the gift of the crucified Christ. We know we're not in it alone. God goes, God, God is with us in it. And it's really, it's very, I actually watched a clip with my mom, and she's like, Stephen Colbert. I'm like, I know, he's a really great articulator of the faith, I have to say. Um, and Anderson Cooper, I mean, I tell you what. He just lost his Well, right, so they were taught, that was a huge, like a, most of their discussion was about grief and suffering and how do you move on. And Colbert talked about God, he talked about his faith. And that's the gift of our faith, is that we know we don't suffer alone. That's the gift, I think he said, of the crucified Christ. We know God does it too. Um, we'll find out. Yeah. How, how would you find it? Just go to YouTube and like Stephen Colbert, Anderson Cooper, it'll show up. Yeah, it was uh, deep. Some people don't choose to do this. They do, and you can. That's why I said you, you choose how you respond. Yes, some people get hard. They've been hurt. They don't want to get hurt again. And then that makes them hard. And, and it's understandable. I think it's sad. But I, I, you know, I get it. Some people choose bitterness and anger. They're mad at God for what happened. Um, which, which, again, I, I think it's not God's fault. <laughs> um, I mean, I had one lady I was talking to, and she was talking about all these terrible, hurtful emails that her daughter was sending to her. And she said, why is God doing this to me? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't put it this way because I was counseling her, and I'm like, oh, sure, there was a part of me that goes, oh, that's your daughter, that's not God. But, you know, we, maybe sometimes it's easier to blame God than the people we love or ourselves. Um, you know, so, yeah. But it can. It can, unfortunately. We, we can't choose how we respond. Um, I, find, I find this very moving in my heart. It says, God's love has been poured into our hearts. And the Holy Spirit, yeah. Which has been given to us. That's just poured into our hearts. That's, that's, that's beautiful. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Hope doesn't disappoint us. We've got that promise. We've got that love. And that's the presence of the Spirit. You know, hope does not disappoint us. Our hope is true and valid. Be yeah, it's beautiful. Always beautiful. Um, so that is sort of this gift. It's in Christ who makes us right with God, who reconciles us, who saves us. There's a lot of different languages that, who gives us life. 
Um, that is all grace. And that was very much Luther's position. Of course, his focus on we are saved by grace through faith, not of works. It is not ourselves. Um, and he talks about, and, and so we are saved by grace. And how do we respond? We don't always respond well. So, Luther would say, we are simultul justus et peccator, Satan sinner. We are saved, but we're not there yet. <laughs> we're not living into the fullness of, and, and we, and I think Luther would argue, in this lifetime, we can't. We are just fallen, sinful human beings. Now, there are theologians who differ on that. We're going to talk about one in a second. But Luther was, Luther had a pretty dire view of the human condition, I have to say. Um, he didn't have a lot of, of faith in people. He had faith in God to change people, but I don't think in people. Um, but one could argue, of course, Christ does free us from sin to stop sinning. See, this is where you get into, I think, a little theological, spiritual, life, living trouble, where you say, oh, I'm saved, so then it doesn't matter how I live the rest of my life, because I've got my ticket to heaven, so I can just be like the worst person ever, because I know I'm going to heaven, because I believe. Well, what is, what is what does belief mean? You know, as I know Luther didn't like James, but James said, faith without works is dead. What is faith if it's not expressing itself in faith? What does that even mean? That's not the biblical meaning of faith, to just say, I made an intellectual agreement with a certain set of doctrines, and therefore I'm saved. Mm, not so much. It's about relationship. Salvation is about what Christ has done for us and our relationship with him and how we relate to Christ and others. It's not just how we think, it's also how we live. And that speaks to the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is sanctification. Hagiozo, Hagia, Hagia Sophia, holy <coughs> wisdom, holy is Hagia. Holy, make holy, consecrate, or sanctify. And this is what some theologians, not Luther and others like him, who again had a dire view of the human condition, would call imparted righteousness. It's the righteousness that we live out, it's how we actually exemplify our salvation in what we say and in what we do and how we think and act. This idea of union with God, that we are becoming more and more Christ-like as we follow Christ. This is much more emphasized in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, where they actually talk about theoasis or divination. Not divination like discerning stuff, but divination in terms of human beings growing into our image of God in its fullness. Um, I think it's Athanasius, or one of those earlier Eastern church fathers who said, you know, God became like us so that we could become like God. Now we Westerners get really hesitant about that language because I think in our selfish individualistic nature, we think, oh, that's high gluten and arrogant that you could be like God. But there's a lot of scripture that would say that we are being made in that we are made in the image of God in the first place, and that in Christ we are being remade into the image of God. And again, I think in the Western world we feel like that gets us off the hook a little bit. Oh, I couldn't possibly like that. So I'm not even gonna try. Um, no, we we are as the Spirit works in our life to be more and more Christ-like. Uh, that is our call. So you get you get First Corinthians six. Well, you get John seventeen, and in fact, the whole farewell discourse, where Jesus says things like, "I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and you are in me if you abide in me." That is that intimate relationship with God in Christ by the Spirit. First Corinthians six: the body is the temple. You're not your own. It matters how you live your life and what you do with your body because you belong to God. And then in this idea of of being full in the spirit, being made complete, seeing who God is, and therefore being like God. First uh, John 3, 2 says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We get 2 Corinthians 3, where Paul makes a comparison between the old covenant represented by Moses and the new covenant, of course, in Christ. So, oh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 3. 12 through 18. Is there someone who could read that for us? Thank you. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull 
for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit is, the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who, with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Pretty clear affirmation that as the Spirit, as the Lord, as God, as the Trinity, works in our lives, freeing us from fear and doubt and insufficiency, we are becoming fuller and fuller reflections of the glory of the image, the being of God, so to speak. Um, we share in his divine nature, which again is a little bit like Western's like, no, no, no. But what else could it mean that the spirit of the Lord is in us and we are made in God's image and we are really made in the image of Christ? Um, I think sometimes our own potential scares us. Um, we try and let ourselves off the hook. Oh, I couldn't possibly be that good. Well, in Christ, in God, by the power of the Spirit, maybe you could. Maybe you could do those incredible, wonderful, moral things um, that you would obviously not otherwise be capable. Pastor, yes. Excuse me. Sure. But the, why do they use the word veil? Is that just like, like to say they don't see? Sure, so Paul is using it literally and metaphorically, because literally in Exodus 34, when Moses went up to talk to the Lord, he was glowing so brightly when he came down that the people are like, whoa, whoa, put a veil over your face. Oh. So they, they couldn't handle the glory of God being reflected in Moses, a fully human human being, by the way, who was shining so brightly with God's glory that the people couldn't even handle it. So, so of course, that's the literal historical example. But of course, metaphorically, People still under the law, people who don't get grace, people who don't understand who God is and who we are, are also not seen clearly. They're also veiled. So he's using it both literally, historically, and spiritually, metaphorically. Okay, good question. Um, Ephesians 4, 1 through 7, we'll get back to that, live a life worthy of the call. And let's read 2 Peter 1, 1 through 7. Let's hear Peter's voice. We've heard a lot of Paul's voice. Go back to 2 Peter 1, 1 through 7. Is there someone who can read that for us? Let's so hear from Peter. Okay. 2 Peter 1, 1 through 7. Mm -hmm. Simon Peter, a servant. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us the very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and for to brotherly kindness love. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Participants in the divine nature. Seems pretty clear what Peter's saying here. You know, we, we actually have God within us who is making us like himself. And again, we see that sort of list of faith that goes to endurance that ends up in love. Always moves from faith to love. We trust, and then we reflect that trust in God and who God is in loving others. But yeah, participates in the divine nature which the East tends to be much more comfortable talking about than the West. Um, the Holy Spirit. But Peter makes it sound like it's a lot of work for us. Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah, but some of the other scripture I would have say, oh, well, God, grace, he loves me, I'm sad. Yes. It's like, uh, I'm done. Yes. But, but Peter really lays it out. Yes. And those 
are both true. <laughs>
even though we differed in the tradition of Luther than in the tradition of Calvin, for sure. So yeah. that actually was my question. Where does Calvin fit juxtaposed to Luther and Wesley just at the moment of what you're talking about? Well, so uh, do you think, so Calvin would be kind of way over here. We can't do a thing. Mm -hmm. We have no free will. God's decided before we even were born who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell. And you're just going to know when you get there. I am not a predestinarian. I think, I think, that, I think that's an un unbiblical and pretty dire philosophy. Um, I don't agree with Calvin. Luther was, he did not, he was not a double predestinarian, the early D. He was not a double predestinarian. He didn't think anybody was destined for hell. He thought everybody could be saved. And he had a little higher view of, of our own agency, but only slightly, because he was insistent that nothing we can do saves us. So he believed in single predestination, that yeah, we're, we're saved. <coughs> he just, you know, it was a little bit more of an open question for Luther. So he, he was not Calvin. Then Wesley over here was like, much more free will, and, and you can achieve it, and you can do it, and just be good, and and so it would kind of be that trajectory. They're all different, of course, but um, um, obviously I, I I like Luther's, but I, I, if I'm going to veer one way or the other, it's going to be toward Wesley for sure. <laughs> There's a lot of beautiful things in Methodism. Um, yeah, very similar. There are a lot of similarities. Um, yes? Huh? Yeah, there are differences. Yeah, yeah. There. Are, that's why we have different denominations because there are differences in how how we you know uh, relate to God and think about God and, and the, theology. Yeah, there's differences in theology. I have some very strong Methodist based in the Methodist Church, and then I came here just because I couldn't find a church and I fell in love with St. John's, and then because I fell in love with it, I wanted to do things and I became very active. And then Pastor and I one day said, "Well, you know, this uh, Luther said you don't have to do anything." 